the wrong to be righted. He is there. Wherever a lone child searches for a friend, he is there. And wherever humanity gropes for that universal meaning of life, he is there. He is everywhere, for he is Commander USA. From the depths of suburbia, far below a teeming shopping mall, just inches away from mankind, Commander USA enters his video vault to bring you action, adventure, and zany non-stop thrills. Join us now as we proudly present Commander USA's Groovy Movies. Today's Groovy Movies, In Search of Dracula and the Woman Who Came Back. And now, Commander USA! We'll see Sonia. Oh, hey, there you are! Commander USA, French Foreign Legion of Decency, retire. <laughs> uh, mes amis, good to see you again. Bonjour and all that type of stuff, eh? Whoa! Hey, how do you like it? Nah, I mean my beret here. Yeah, that's French for chapeau, you know? Oh, yeah, I'm feeling kind of French today. Oh, it's feeling real good because it's a famous French guy's birthday. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have a little celebration right here in the video vault. Yeah, I was just telling my pal Lefty about it, you know? Where is that little scare? Lefty! Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, here he is. Yeah, you know my pal Lefty, don't you? Ah, uh, sure. It's my hand puppet. Oh, uh, we go back a long way, boy, yeah. Hey, Lefty, there you are. <laughs> oh, yeah. Heck, me and Lefty have been around together a long time, and I happen to know that the guy's birthday, who's today, is one of Lefty's favorites. What? You don't know? Oh, oh heck, this is gonna be fun. Hey, since we're doing a French kind of show today, I think I'll call you gauche. No, no, I don't mean that you're gauche. I mean, that's kind of French for left, you know? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, it's gonna be a whole lot of fun. Hey, can you guess whose birthday it is? No, I, I'll give you a hint here. He's, uh, well, he's kind of a, well, heck, if you were a neo thomas philosopher kind of person, you know? You'd probably be real upset with this guy's values. Yeah, you get it? No, huh? Okay, if you were a logical positivist, then, you'd be, like, real upset that he had such an easy willingness to exchange Twinkies for Ding Dongs. No, no, yeah. Oh, here. Hey, you'll get this one, boy. Yeah, let me just show you something here. Whoa. How about... Right. Oh, sorry, pal. Yeah, how about that, huh? No, yeah. Sure, Jean-Paul Sartre. Oh, yeah, one of the famous ones, boy. Oh, good old Jean-Paul. Yeah, today's his birthday, see? Yeah, he was born in 1805 on June 21st. Yeah, sure. What a guy, too, boy. You know, there's a rumor around that his older cousin was Albert Schweitzer. Yeah. No, no, not that Albert Schweitzer, the one that invented the bunny hop. Oh, yeah, you know the one I'm talking about. Oh, sure. Good old Jean-Paul, boy. Yeah, he's an existentialist. You know, you know existentialism in that, uh... Wait here. Let me explain it to you, see? Now, if you think of existentialism kind of as a void or a nothingness, this balloon will show it to you. Yeah, watch this. Hey, give me a hand there, left. Yeah, now see, you take a balloon and you think about the space that's inside it, you know? And then you very carefully take away the outside. Oh, yeah. And then what you got left, see, is the nothingness. It's the void. And so you kind of put yourself in there and ask yourself one of those, well, one of those inside space kind of questions. You know what I mean? Yeah, makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, sure. Because philosophers are always thinking, you know? Oh, yeah, from the day they're born, they're always thinking, and they're always searching for truth. And vampires. <laughs> no, they're not really searching for vampires, but vampires search for stuff. We know what that is, don't we? Yeah, blood. Oh, and the whole reason I bring it up, boy, is because we're gonna see a groovy movie today. Yeah, let me just get the telepsychotronic screen heat and radiation shield open here, boy. Oh, yeah, this is gonna make you flip, yeah. <laughs> wow! Boy, that still impresses me. Oh, yeah. Now, this first movie we're going to see is unbelievable. Yeah, it's called In Search of Dracula. Oh, now take a look at this, boy. Yeah, it's kind of like a documentary style. I think you might even call it On the Road with Christopher Lee. Yeah, look at this. Whoa, all kinds of things going on here, boy. Hey, 
and they were even gonna show us some clips of the first Dracula movie ever made. Oh yeah, it's gonna be real exciting. Whoa! Holy, whoa! Oh, you can tell it's gonna be a good day, huh? And then, the second feature of the day, the woman who came back. Oh yeah, see, this is like about a witch, you know? And she goes back to Eben Rock, Massachusetts, and she becomes a commodities broker. Yeah, she makes a killing in futures. <laughs> oh, no, now, look. See, she can't tell if she's possessed or... Well, she's afraid of getting dispossessed. Oh, she's got all kinds of problems. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and hey, there's a great German shepherd in this one. Oh, okay. Let's not go barking up the wrong tree, huh? Time to get started right away with In Search of Dracula. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy.
Dracula, published in 1897, is one of the all-time great money-making novels. It has been sold in millions of copies throughout the world. This greatest of all horror classics has also been a hit play in several countries and has inspired more commercially successful films than any other novel. Dracula was written by the Irish author Bram Stoker, best known in his own time as the business manager of Henry Irving, one of the most famous theatrical personalities of the Victorian age. Stoker is supposed to have modeled Dracula's physical appearance on Irving. The novel tells the story of Count Dracula, who plans to gain control of the world by turning everyone into vampires. He leaves his ancestral home in Transylvania and goes to England, taking with him several boxes of earth as his daylight hours must be spent resting on his native soil. Transylvania, which means the land beyond the forest, is often thought to be a mythical place. In fact, it is an ancient province of Romania which consists of a high plateau ringed by the rugged Carpathian Mountains. Even today, it is one of the wildest and least known parts of Europe. The population is of rich national origins, Romanian, Hungarian, Slav, German, and Seke. In the book, Count Dracula speaks of his descent from these Sekes, whose ancestors were probably Huns. Stoker never visited Transylvania, but gained most of his knowledge at the British Museum from old maps and guidebooks. He made free use of Transylvanian history, folklore, and geography to create an atmosphere of terror. He wrote that every known superstition in the world was gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians as if it was some sort of imaginary whirlpool. On leaving the Carpathians, Count Dracula journeys to England and proceeds immediately to Carfax an old castle where he intends to hide while ravaging the countryside. Dracula must remain in his grave during the daytime, but at night his lust for blood becomes unquenchable, his brain power limitless, and his physical strength irresistible. He quickly adds to his countless list of victims. Yeah, I had a good time. Oh, hey, excuse me. Yeah, Lefty and me were just kind of chatting. Yeah, kind of reminiscing, you know? I mean, being Jean-Paul Sartre's birthday and everything, we were talking about the time we flew over to Paris. Yeah, and I remembered I had this old home movie. So I dug it up, put it up on this telesegatronic screen. Here, take a look at this. Yeah. See, we flew over. Yeah, oh, there we are, right over Paris, boy, yeah. That's us flying over the Eiffel Tower there. Oh, well, yeah, we sure did get an Eiffel, too. Yeah, now that's a large building. See, it was put up in the late 1800s with the world's largest erector set. Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, now look at this. Here we are in front of Jean Paul's house. Oh, what a place, eh? Yeah, I actually went up to the door and knocked and everything. Jean Paul's wife came out, though, you know, and she said Jean Paul was kind of upset that day. Yeah, I don't know what it was exactly, but something about him having just proved that there were no moral absolutes. And one turned up in his Rice Krispies. Well, heck, that didn't ruin anybody's day, you know what I mean? Yeah, but good old Jean Paul, though, he didn't let me down. Uh -uh, he wrote me a little note and everything. Yeah, because he couldn't come down to see me, you know? And I've kept it all these years. Yeah, listen to this. He says, dear commander. Well, it's French for commander, you know? Yeah, here is my philosophy pour le jour. Yeah, it's kind of like a soup of the day, but with thoughts, you know what I mean? Yeah, he says, don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but Isaac Newton. Oh, you realize the gravity of the situation? Yeah, maybe not, huh? Better get back to the movie. <laughs>
eventually, Dracula is found out and forced to flee England. He makes for his remote castle in Transylvania, certain that no one will be able to trace him there. Stoker located Dracula's castle near Bistritza in northern Transylvania. Although he had never visited the area, his descriptions were remarkably accurate. He writes, the road was cut through pine woods that seemed in the darkness to be closing down upon us. As the evening fell, great masses of grayness produced a weird and solemn effect. Beyond rose the forest up to the lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves, blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where grass and rock mingled an endless perspective of mountains losing themselves in the distance. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side. We were entering the Borgo Pass itself. A sinister silence seemed to settle, but for a strange music afar. <laughs> According to the novel, Dracula's castle was not mentioned in any guidebook, nor did it appear on any map. Stoker wrote, we looked back and saw where the clear line of Dracula's castle cut the sky. There was something wild and uncanny about the place. We could hear the distant howling of wolves. At the end of the story, Count Dracula is about to reach the safety of his castle when he is caught by the hero Jonathan Harker and the vampire expert Dr. Van Helsing. Just as the sun is about to set, Dracula's head is cut off with a kukri or Gurkha knife and a Bowie knife is plunged into his heart. Count Dracula instantly turns to dust and vanishes forever. In reality, Peasant life in the more remote villages of Transylvania has not changed much for centuries, and belief in vampires and other superstitions is still strong, though such things are now rarely spoken of. Living today in the valley of Argish, below Castle Dracula, is the gypsy Tinker. She recalls that when her father was laid out for burial in 1932, it was discovered that rigor mortis had not set in the skin was still pliable, and the cheeks bore a ruddy complexion. The villagers believed that, of course, he must be a vampire, so they plunged a wooden stake through his heart, and as an added safeguard, burned his body. Vampire belief has existed since the dawn of civilization throughout the world, but has been most common in Eastern Europe. Vampires are creatures of the night, who can either be men or women. In Eastern Europe, they are supposed to have two souls and are neither alive nor dead, but undead, as one soul never dies. Vampires cannot rest in the grave, but must spend the night searching for victims, people or animals whose blood they drink. The victims either die immediately or gradually waste away, and some become vampires after death. At cock crow or when the morning bell tolls, Vampires must return to their coffins or risk dissolving in the sunlight. They spend their daylight hours in the grave, their bodies undecomposed, and around their mouths and under their fingernails are traces of blood. The universal fear of death and the impossible desire for eternal life are deeply rooted in vampire belief, as is the oriental concept of reincarnation or eternal return. Shot in the foot of the 
In Transylvania, vampirism was originally a folk superstition rather than a religious idea. It probably came from Asia by caravan route and with the nomadic Magyars around the birth of Christ, centering in the Carpathian mountains and mixing with a rich folklore of that region. Who can become a vampire? Criminals, witches, those born with teeth, those under a curse, and young children who die unchristened. The seventh son of a seventh son is doomed. And one must be very cautious of a man who does not eat garlic. Vampires can assume a variety of animal forms, such as large dogs, snakes, or bats, and in Romania, particularly, wolves and black cats. They are tremendously strong. They cast no shadow, have no reflection in mirrors, and can make themselves invisible by dissolving into a mist. It is also believed that every year on St. Andrew's Eve, vampires meet at places like uh, graveyards to decide on their programs for the coming year, who is to be killed and by whom. Transylvanian folklore, vampires are almost always peasants rather than noblemen, as literary tradition would have it. However, Countess Elizabeth Bartory, born in 1570, was a famous exception. Her family coat of arms consisted of three wolves' teeth, and Elizabeth herself was said to have been a living vampiress or werewolf. In her castle in northern Hungary, she butchered nearly 600 young girls, bathing and showering in their blood which she hoped would keep her eternally young and beautiful. Still standing in Vienna is her house on Blutgasse, Blood Street, where she perpetrated many of her horrible deeds. Eventually, Elizabeth's monstrous crimes were discovered and she was walled into a cell in her castle. Here she died 12 years later, never again having seen the light of day. This traditional Romanian dance, here performed by the National Folklore Ballet, was once used to exorcise evil spirits. The solo dancer was beaten with sticks and bitten by his fellow dancers in an attempt to frighten away the devil. Witchcraft, diabolism, and vampirism are all closely associated. For instance, the snake or dragon is an ancient symbol for the devil, Dracul in Romanian, which frequently appears in Romanian paintings and literature. The legend of St. George and the Dragon is very reminiscent of both Vlad's impalings and the killings of vampires with stakes. Vampires are also said to be most active between the eaves of St. Andrew and St. George, a superstition which is closely tied to the Greek Orthodox religion.
Greek Orthodox Church has often unjustly been credited with originating the vampire concept. However, the Greek Church has always leaned towards mysticism and attached great importance to complicated rituals and the worship of saints and icons, thus creating a hotbed for all sorts of superstitions. Vampire belief may sometimes have been used by the Church to increase its hold on the people in much the same way as it used belief in witchcraft. For centuries, the Greek Orthodox Church taught that the bodies of those excommunicated would not decompose in the grave. As vampires, according to popular belief, were recognizable because their bodies did not decompose in the grave, excommunication meant becoming a vampire on death. administered exorcism. This was sufficient to seal the vampire in its grave. However, history shows that most people did not trust the power of the church over vampires. Petstone Films presents a movie about people. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, don't get too close here. This might be dangerous. What this reminds me of? Yeah, look at this stuff. Yeah. Extra secret special liquid. Just what we need for dry ice. <laughs> yeah, you knew I was gonna work with dry ice today, didn't you? Oh, this is great. This stuff is real exciting. But you know, if you ever come across this stuff, you know what I mean? If you go into the ice cream business or something and you're handling this stuff, remember, always use tongs. Not tongue. Tons, okay? Heck, you get stuck to this stuff, it's a little bit dangerous, you know, and it's real hot. But heck, it does great things, you know. Yeah, this is frozen carbon dioxide. Well, actually, it's not really frozen, but it looks fro. Here, watch this. Watch what happens. Oh, this is gonna be great. Oh! Holy cats, that's even better than I thought. You know, they make this stuff by taking carbon dioxide and just putting it under a lot of pressure. Yeah, I feel like that sometimes myself. Well, here it comes. Hey! Talk about a two cents plane, hey. What do you think it happened if I put in another one? Oh, sure, let's give it a shot. Why not? Here, we'll give it a little, ah, a little sprinkle. Make like it's for Tinkerbell here. <laughs> Hey, here you are. Oh, hey, one more time. What do you think? Oh, hey, have you ever seen anything like that? Yeah, that, no, no, that's not like this. Uh, it looks kind of like it, but... Hey, talk about easing out, huh? Perpetual motion. I've never seen anything like it. Oh, well, hey. I'll watch the bubbles. You watch what's coming up. <laughs> the drinking of blood and sacrificial blood offerings have played an important role in most great religions. For thousands of years, man has endowed blood with magical powers, such as that drinking the blood of someone of great strength increases one's own strength. During Mass, the priest drinks wine, which has become the blood of Christ through transubstantiation, and the congregation eats the bread or flesh of Christ, who is thus sacrificed to God anew. The Gospel according to St. John holds a passage which could well apply to the vampire mixing its blood with that of its victim. Except ye eateth the flesh of the Son of Man, and drinketh its blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The vampire bat has many things in common with its human counterpart. 
an erect head, web-like hands for wings, and the ability to walk upright. A bite from its extremely sharp teeth has an anesthetic quality, and its saliva contains an anticoagulant which quickens the flow of blood from the wounds it inflicts on its victims. The attack of the vampire bat is very like that of the folklore vampire. It first stalks and hypnotizes its prey, after which it bites into a vein and begins to lap up blood with its long tongue. Creatures of the night are thought to stir, and vampires rise from the grave. People must be careful in passing old ruins, crossroads, and churchyards. The erotic element in vampirism is very strong. For instance, the vampire is said to be the only night creature capable of sex, although his children are born without bones. He usually chooses one particular woman in a specific locality to be his bride and relentlessly pursues her in a kind of macabre courtship. He may attack others, but if he is denied his chosen loved one, he may go berserk and wreak havoc.
See, oh, hey, there you are. Hey, look who dropped by. Yeah, it's my old pal, Polly. Yeah, Polly used to work navigation for me when I was flying across the Atlantic, you know? All right, great old friend. Yeah, we've been working on a couple little tricks here. Hey, you want to show him, Paul? Yeah, she does a little dance. Yeah, look at this wing dip she does. Whoa! Hey, Polly, not be... Yeah, watch this one now. Hey, Polly, jump over the chair. Hey, you are right on top. Whoa! Holy cats. Hey, that's terrific. Hey, would you want to see something that'll knock you out? Here, listen to this. Polly, say hello. Hello. <laughs> say goodbye. Goodbye. Whoa! Polly, you want a cracker? Polly wants some blood. Whoa! Whoa! Hey! Oh. Ah. Hey, you want to get sent back to the Belfry? Yeah, we'll get back to the movie right after this. Calm down, you little rascal. You cheat. In former times, the report of a vampire attack created panic. Everyone took immediate precautions to protect themselves, especially during the hours between sundown and sunrise. Bells were rung to sound the alarm and were thought to frighten vampires away. People shut themselves tightly indoors. Many left the countryside to seek shelter in towns, and shepherds drove their flocks to safety, as vampires might attack sheep as well as humans. At night, Torches were lit outside, and many candles were kept burning inside. People sat up until cock crow and told stories. For when stories are told, vampires cannot approach. In some areas, vampires were thought to be unable to cross running water, and throughout Transylvania, garlic was an extremely potent weapon. Windows and doors were anointed with this garlic, and all cows and other farm animals were supposed to be rubbed with it to protect them as well. The thorns of wild roses were sure to keep vampires away. Thus, thorns or poppy seeds were spread on the paths leading from the local churchyard to the village. When the vampire took the path, he had to stop to pick up every one of the thorns or seeds. This so delayed him that he could not reach the village before sunrise, at which time he had to return to the grave. Large black dogs with an extra set of eyes painted on them in white also discouraged vampires. The church added the cross and the communion wafer as major weapons against vampires. As soon as a vampire began to ravage an area, an all-out effort was made to find its grave and destroy it. One common method of locating a vampire was to choose a boy or girl young enough to be a virgin and seat them naked on a horse of a solid color, which was also a virgin and had never stumbled. The horse was led through the cemetery and over all of the graves, recognizable from one or several holes big enough. The vampire's tomb was also supposed to be for a serpent to pass through. <coughs> the 
the most usual way of killing a vampire was to drive a stake through the heart or navel during daylight hours when the vampire lay in its grave. The stake had to be made from a wild rose bush, an ash or asp tree. In some areas, iron bars, preferably heated red hot, were used instead of wood. to be driven through the body and into the ground under the corpse to keep the vampire from rising again. As the stake pierced it, the body twisted in agony and fresh blood flowed. A horrible scream also accompanied the act, after which a look of peace settled on the vampire's face. The final release from torment in real death. Many other means of killing vampires were practiced. The vampire's head was sometimes cut off and put between the legs of the corpse, or the body could be buried at crossroads or burnt and the ashes strewn in a river. According to Romanian legend, if a vampire is not found and rendered harmless, it first kills all members of its immediate family and then the other inhabitants of the village. At last, the vampire climbs up into the belfry of the church and calls out the names of any survivors who instantly die. Or, in some areas, the vampire rings the death knell and all who hear it die on the spot. Inevitably, the folkloric vampire of Eastern Europe began to disappear in modern times. But in 1964, Dr. Robert McCulley of the Medical University of South Carolina published the only authentic psychological case study of a person showing vampire traits. The subject was Bill, a young, unmarried, white, male American. He displayed the essential vampire characteristics. He was clearly aware of bearing a terrible curse, the ever-constant desire for life and renewal, coupled with a horrible wish to destroy human beings in order to maintain his own existence. Bill performed acts of vampirism on himself, that is, he drank his own blood. has always been a creature of nightmares, the nocturnal spirit who embraces the sleeper to suck his blood. Bill frequently reported dreams of bloodletting and felt anxiety upon awakening. Sometimes these dreams were filled with a sense of peace and being loved by someone, but sometimes Bill felt that he had subdued someone who had attacked him. He often dreamed of sucking blood from the necks of young boys. 
Bill spent most of his time wandering about alone and constantly suffered from an unexplained cycle. Four days of elation, followed by 12 days of depression. His deepest depression coincided with the appearance of the full moon. Bill's case defies conventional psychology. He had no knowledge of the vampire myth. However, his earliest childhood memories were strangely significant. At the age of seven, he saw a dog hit by a car lying in a dark pool of blood in the street. He also recalls that after a walk in the park together with his nurse, she placed his warm hands on her cold neck. Extensive psychological testing showed Bill to be intelligent, but emotionally very immature. However, nothing directly pathological was established, except possibly a fascination with blood and the mystical. Bill's interpretation of the Rorschach cards was very revealing. The lower part of the anatomy of some large animal, part of a living thing, or once part of a living thing. The red could be blood that came from it, ripped out of a dissected corpse. On second look, the red seems like a fluid draining symmetrically. Dr. McCulley reasons that Bill may not have been mentally ill in the usual sense, and offers a startling theory that the ancient vampire image may be one of the primitive arch types suggested by Dr. Carl Jung. Concepts which supposedly govern our thoughts, hidden deep within everybody's unconscious mind. McCulley speculates that the vampire arch type may have mysteriously risen from the unconscious and taken possession of Bill, and that in the same way, all of us might have the potential to become vampires. Hey, <sighs> there you... Whoa. Hey, Commander USA here. I'm just... Whoa, bats! Holy cats! Whoa! Hey, what's go? Whoa! Hey, I'll be back in a minute, eh? Get the hat! Whoa! Whoa! Hey! Yeah, hold on a minute here. I'm not sure what's happening. Whoa! Oh! Holy cats! Hey! It's Count Phantom from Pennsylvania! Oh! You must be Commander Yuza. Yes, that's right. Well, it's USA, actually, John. Oh, hey, it's good to much. meet you, pal. Boy, I've seen is you in some place. Whoa! Oh, hey. That's just a little count joke, isn't it? Sure, you wouldn't really bite me, would you? It's kind of tough to get through to super skin it. Well, never mind about oh, that. You'll try. Holy ca Hey, Count, you're looking sharp there. Boy, am I glad you showed up today at the video vault. I've been waiting a long time to meet you, pal. Oh, just a look. Hey, listen. How the heck do you do that? I mean, I'm not looking to get a, give away any secrets or, or anything like that, but uh, how do you do that disappearance stuff? Very nicely, I think. Hey, <laughs> very... Oh, 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 that's comedy, too, huh? Hey, that's pretty good. No, but I mean, you just turn from a bat into a guy. It happens when I'm hungry. Oh, I see. Oh, does that mean you're hungry now? Hey, maybe I could get you something, a little uh, tube steak or something? Anything but a steak. <laughs> oh, yeah, hey, pretty good. Cool. Yeah, yeah. What do you usually drink with your meals, though? I mean, I could fix something up for you. Typo. Whoa! Excuse me, but could you tell me how to get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. <laughs> oh, you make a right on 57th Street. Yeah, you can take it right out this way. Oh. You know that guy? I thought he was a friend of yours. Oh, I don't think so. Oh, hey, Cal. He's not with you? I gotta talk to the exterminator upstairs. But heck, hey, listen, I'm real excited to meet you, boy. Hey, it's really, I love those movies you're in, you know? I've what? been meaning to speak to you about that. Yeah? They are my whole movies. I know that, I really am. Where is my royalty oh, check? I knew you were talking about a check, weren't you? You remember that agreement you signed? Oh, about six years ago? You don't remember that? Do you remember the photos? It was signed in red. Oh, you still got them, huh? You said you'd never shown anybody. Hey, listen, Cal, listen. Hey, I'll tell you. We'll 
we'll get back to the movie. And I'll get back to the car! Modern criminologists may well term the 15th century prince Vlad Tsepesh Dracula a living vampire. This dreaded Romanian prince, described in contemporary pamphlets as a monster of tyrannical cruelty, inspired Bram Stoker to create his character, Count Dracula. The prince was best known as Sepesh, which means impaler, because of his fondness for that form of torture and execution. However, he was also known as Dracula, which in Romanian can mean either son of the devil or son of the dragon. Stoker simply drew upon the rich Romanian vampire tradition in resurrecting Vlad as Count Dracula. The Count, as described in the novel, closely resembles various 15th century portraits of Vlad. Stoker writes, his face was a strong aquiline with a thin, high-bridged nose and peculiarly arched nostrils. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, as far as I could see under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking. This painting of the martyrdom of St. Andrew from Dracula's own time includes him as an observer. As St. Andrew was the patron saint of the Saxons, Vlad may have been shown because of his reputed cruelty towards Saxons. But in Romania, St. Andrew is also said to be the protector of vampires. The only existing life-size portrait of Vlad is located at Ambrasch Castle near Innsbruck, Austria. Archduke Ferdinand II, who owned the castle during the 16th century, had a perverse hobby of documenting the villains and deformed personalities of history. If such persons could be found alive, the Archduke tried to settle them at the castle. A few giants, a notorious dwarf, and the wolfman from the Canary Islands stayed on at Ambrush Castle for some years in order to have their portraits painted. The wolfman had a normal wife, but his two children inherited his hairy skin and devilish countenance. Ferdinand's gallery of rogues and monsters contains many grisly studies. Dracula's reputation as a mass murderer ensured his place in the Archduke's collection. Vlad Dracula's birthplace in Transylvania is the old German fortified town of Sigisoara, south of Bistritza. The house in which Vlad was born bears a plaque identifying his father, Vlad Dracul, the devil, prince of Wallachia. Some historians consider Vlad Dracula a hero who fought for Christianity and the independence of his country against the Turks. Others claim he was a madman who killed and tortured wantonly for sadistic pleasure. Dracula may not have been more cruel than many other rulers of the 15th century, such as Mohammed II of Turkey, Ivan the Terrible, or Cesare Borgia, but his executions were much greater in number. In creating Count Dracula, Stoker may have been struck by the similarity between Vlad's impalings and the killing of vampires by driving stakes through their bodies. Impalement was a fairly rare form of execution and Vlad was one of the few rulers to use it. Horses were usually employed to pull a victim onto a stake so that it pierced the length of the body. The pail was then put into an upright position and the victim left to die, which sometimes took agonizing hours or even days. 
Dracula's best-known mass impalement took place in 1459 on Tampa Hill above Brasov. Here, Dracula and his boyars feasted for a whole month while thousands of Saxons were methodically impaled on neat rows of stakes around them. This contemporary German woodcut depicts the scene. It is said that Dracula's chief pleasure was to dine with his court, surrounded by dead and dying people impaled on stakes. Once, a certain nobleman was supposed to have complained that he could not enjoy his meal because of the stench of rotting corpses surrounding the table. Dracula thereupon had the nobleman impaled on a much higher stake than the others so that he would be above the stench. Countless such tales about Dracula's bloody deeds and macabre sense of humor persist to this day in Transylvania. Most of them portray him as merciless yet possessed of a strange sense of justice and tragic destiny, much like Count Dracula. According to legend, a Hungarian merchant once came to Vlad's city. While he slept, someone stole 160 gold ducats from him. The merchant went to Dracula and told him of his loss. Dracula said, Go your way, and in the morning you will find your gold. He then commanded that a search be made for the gold throughout the city and said that if the thief was not found, he would burn the entire town. When the merchant arose next morning, he found his money returned. He counted it once and then twice. There was one ducat too many. The merchant went again to Dracula and said, My lord, I have found the gold, but there is one ducat more which is not mine. Dracula then revealed that he had ordered the extra ducat placed there and said that if the merchant had not told him about it, he would have impaled him with the thief. The merchant was very grateful to Dracula and took his card and left the city. Excuse me, boy. Now I was just thinking. No, not about anything in particular. It was just kind of in honor of Jean-Paul Sartre. Well, yeah, today's his birthday, but heck, you knew that, didn't you? Sarah was born in 1905. Oh, yeah, he was great, too. You know, one of the real existentialist philosophers, you know? I mean, you ever think about existentialism? Oh, yeah, well, it's kind of a, well, it's kind of a deep subject, but, you know, if, if you kind of picture, like, well, a nothingness, you know, a void, like, well, heck, did you ever sit inside an empty milk truck? Yeah, and you remember that kind of damp, hollow, echoey feeling you had all around you? Oh, yeah, so you just picture that kind of nothingness, you know, and put yourself right there, and then wiggle your toes. Oh, yeah, you got to make sure you're still connected, huh? <laughs> Boy, this philosophy stuff is great, you know what I mean? Yeah, it really keeps you thinking. Hey, talking about thinkers, Here's another great thinker, boy. Yeah, you know this guy? Ah, oh, sure you do. That's the thinker. Oh, well, kind of the commander's version, anyway. Yeah, what do you think he's thinking? Probably where he left his clothes, eh? Yeah, but he's hoping there won't be an early frost. <laughs> hey, we'll get back to the movie right after this, okay? Happy birthday, Jean-Paul. Oh. Problem of poverty in his kingdom by inviting all poor people and beggars to a great banquet and then setting fire to the hall. Everyone inside was burned alive. In a particular place, there was a spring of cold, fresh water, and many came to drink. Dracula placed a large, fine, golden cup by the spring. All who drank from the cup returned it to its place, and while blood Dracula lived, no one dared steal it. Dracula had a peasant mistress who lived in a poor outlying part of Tulgovishta. He visited her often, but his interest was purely physical. The woman, on the other hand, fell in love with Dracula and grew afraid of losing him. 
One night, she told him that she was going to have his child. Dracula became angry and said that this would not be. He then cut her open from her loins to her breast and said, let the world see where I have been and where my fruit lay. Bram Stoker did not know that a real castle Dracula existed, but his description of the Count's castle at the Borgo Pass is uncannily apt. The real castle Dracula is perched on top of a rock, 1,000 feet above the Argos River in Wallachia. It is nearly inaccessible from the valley. The original fortress was very old, but Vlad rebuilt it when he came to power and ever since it has been known as the castle of Vlad, Tsepesh, Vlad the Impaler. Reconstruction of the castle was a nearly superhuman feat, accomplished in typical Dracula fashion. One of Vlad's brothers, Nilsea, had been killed by the boyars of Tergovishta. It is said that Dracula retaliated by seizing the boyars during the Easter celebrations when they were all dressed in their finest clothes. He impaled the old people and put the younger people, men, women and children, to work rebuilding the castle. They are supposed to have labored until their clothes became rags and dropped off their backs. Many died from overwork and fell from the cliffs but the castle was finished within a few months. Dracula's reign was dominated by his confrontation with Mohammed the Conqueror of Turkey. By 1461, Vlad had achieved sufficient power to plan an all-out campaign to rid Romania of the Turks. The Sultan became aware of his ambitions and sent envoys to negotiate a truce with him. However, they had secret instructions to lure Vlad into a trap where he would be seized by Turkish troops. The story goes that when the emissaries refused to remove their turbans in Vlad's presence, as it was against their custom, he ordered the turbans nailed to their heads and sent them away, saying that the Turks must learn to respect the customs of a great leader. History records only that Vlad sensed treachery and captured the entire Turkish force. He impaled them on a forest of stakes outside the walls of his capital, Tergovishta, placing the envoys on two stakes higher than the rest in deference to their rank. He then launched his famous campaign along the Danube River with a force of between 10 and 20,000 men consisting mostly of rapid-moving cavalry and peasant conscripts, Vlad pushed all the way to the Black Sea. At first, Vlad met with great success. After his capture of the fortress of Giurgiu, he wrote to King Matthias of Hungary that 23,809 men had been slain and impaled. Vlad was certain of the figure because their heads had been carefully counted apart from 884 who were burnt in their houses and whose heads, of course, could not be collected. During the famous Night of Terror, he boldly attacked the Sultan's camp. However, his bodyguard read it and Vlad was forced to retreat. The road to Tukovishta now lay open, but the Turks were greeted by the grisly remains of the Sultan's envoys and troops impaled by Vlad the previous year and now blackened by the sun and half-eaten by birds. The Sultan was moved to tears and said, What can we do with a man like this? He ordered the retreat of his army, but a small force in command of Vlad's own brother, Radu, was directed to pursue Dracula to his remote castle high in the mountains above the Argus River. Radu laid siege to the fortress, during which Dracula's wife despaired and took her own life by casting herself from a parapet to the Argus River far below. Vlad himself was forced to flee through a secret tunnel on a horse shot backwards to confuse pursuers. After
After escaping the Turks by crossing the nearly impassable Transylvanian Alps, Dracula sought the protection of King Matthias at Fadarash Castle. Instead of granting Vlad a sanctuary, the king had him arrested. Little is known about Dracula's life in exile, but he apparently could not control his lust for blood. A Russian story relates that he used to catch mice and buy birds in the market, then torture and impale them on rows of small sticks. In Stoker's novel, Count Dracula's mad helper, Renfield, also took a sadistic pleasure in torturing small animals. Vlad was a handsome man, and his fabled power over women soon led to a romance with one of King Matthias' sisters. They were eventually married, and Dracula regained his freedom. Vlad did succeed in recapturing Tolgovishta and the citadel of Bucharest from his brother Radu, but only two months after regaining the Wallachian throne, he was killed outside of Bucharest. He had disguised himself as a Turkish soldier in order to obtain precise information about the enemy. His head was sent to Istanbul as a trophy for the Sultan. Vlad's headless body is said to have been found by monks from Snardot Monastery in the marshes near Bucharest, who secretly interred him in a crypt facing the chapel altar. In 1931, the tomb was opened, but the casket and body were missing. Later on, another grave was discovered near the front door to the chapel. It is possible that Vlad's body was moved because the monks did not want to have someone of his sinister reputation buried close to the altar. A Romanian peasant belief holds that Vlad Dracula will someday rise again to save the country in a time of great trouble. A well-known Romanian poem goes, Dracula, where are you now that we need you? Eastern Europe, and particularly Transylvania, has long been known to folklore experts and devotees of Dracula alike as the center of vampire belief. But the vampire in literature owes its fame almost entirely to the works of English and Irish authors. The most successful of these vampire tales were written during the 19th century. This was the age of Gothic horror, and countless stories of the terrible and the unknown flooded the bookshops of England. Strangely enough, the two most famous literary and movie monsters were born at the same time. The undead vampire Count and Dr. Frankenstein's living monster, fashioned from dead bodies. It happened in 1815 at the magnificent Villa Diodati on the shores of Lake Geneva in Switzerland. Lord Byron the leading literary figure of the century, was spending the summer there, together with his 20-year-old physician, John Polidori. Percy Bysshe Shelley and his 18-year-old wife-to-be, Mary, had rented a modest house nearby. According to Mary's diary, Rainy evenings were spent round the fire at the Villa Diodati, reading ghost stories and discussing the supernatural. One night, Byron suggested that they all write their own ghost stories. He himself never finished his, but Polidori, who also had literary ambitions, turned Byron's story into the first English vampire novel, The Vampire, published in 1816. His hero, Lord Ruthven, was the first in a long line of vampire counts culminating in Stoker's Count Dracula. Polidori probably intended Lord Ruthven as a parody of Byron, who he felt had mistreated him. Byron did have some classic vampire characteristics. He once, for instance, lived in a half-ruined abbey, and in later years wore only black, ate almost nothing to keep slim, and drank vinegar to make his face pale. He also had an extraordinary power over women and young men.
Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, perhaps the first work of science fiction, also took form one evening at the Villa Diodati, during which everybody discussed Darwin's theories and human efforts to create life. Afterwards, Mary went to bed in an uneasy mood and experienced a terrible nightmare. my pal left well you know lefty don't you ah sure he's my aunt puppy yeah we're getting a little hungry you know so we figured we'd make something kind of exotic for lunch yeah it's kind of like shish kebab but heck we call it bat kebab oh yeah this is really great boy mmm you've never tasted anything like this boy i guarantee well unless you spend some time in andalusia you know oh it's big hit down there big dish oh yes this is great now you just slip your bats on and if you're near an open fire, heck, just toast them up a little bit. Or else, heck, you can eat them just like they are. Oh, yeah, it's delicious. Mmm. Oh. Oh, I take... Mmm. You know, it tastes kind of like chicken. Hey, Lefty, want some? No, how about a wing? <laughs> what? He said no fangs. <laughs> hey, we'll get back to the movie right after this, okay? Okay. Yeah, that was pretty good. When is that you? Norman, answer me! Yes, Mother. It's me. Norman Bates is back to normal. But Mother's off her rocker again. Mother! Norman! I'll get you for this, Mother. You haven't got the guts, boy! Psycho 3, rated R. Starts Wednesday, July 2nd at select theaters. She awoke in fright and could not go back to sleep. The next morning, she began writing her story. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my task. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out. Then, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathes hard, and a convulsive motion agitates its limbs. Mary Shelley's diary provides some clues as to how she conceived of Frankenstein. During 1814, she took a trip up the Rhine River on Sunday, September the 4th, she writes, We leave Mainz at 6 o'clock and proceed in a little boat. The banks of the Rhine are very fine, rocks and mountains crowned with lonely castles. One such castle Mary probably visited was the Burg Frankenstein, built atop the densely forested Magnetburg mountain. Within this castle in 1673 was born a famous alchemist who searched for the elixir of life through diabolical experiments. Mary, no doubt, heard this strange story as well as others about the mysterious barons Frankenstein. The castle chapel has an eerie atmosphere which would have made a strong impression on the young Mary Shelley.
Stone reliefs mark the graves of several long dead Frankensteins who met with violent ends. A curse was supposed to have destroyed three members of the family in rapid succession. There is also the legend of Baron Georg von Frankenstein, who killed a dragon that was chasing his lady love, Anne Maria, only to be killed himself. Mary's diary also tells of a visit to Mont Blanc and the Sea of Ice, so lyrically described in her book by the creature himself. Monday, July the 22nd, Chamonix. As we continued, the mountains increased in height and beauty. The summit of the highest was hidden in clouds, but they sometimes peeped out into the blue sky, higher, one would think, than the safety of God would permit. Tuesday, July the 23rd, Chamonix. We continued our route on foot and came to the source, which lies like a stage surrounded on three sides by mountains and glaciers. We sat on a rock which formed the fourth side, gazing on the scene before us. An immense glacier was on our left. In the cathedral at CBU, Transylvania, is buried Baron Frank von Frankenstein. Oddly enough, Dracula's only legitimate son, Minea the Bad, was murdered in the church and is said to be buried there as well. By the middle of the 19th century, interest in vampires and vampirism had spread throughout Europe. In England, Weekly serial novels had become the rage. One of the most popular was Varney the Vampire or The Feast of Blood. It was of doubtful literary value, but the piece ended spectacularly with the vampire baron throwing himself into the hissing mouth of Mount Vesuvius. But it was a woman vampire rather than a man who set the stage for Dracula. Sheridan Lefanu, Irish master of the supernatural, published Carmilla in 1872. The story made a deep impression on Bram Stoker, who was then a civil servant in Dublin and an unpaid theater critic. 10 years later, the flamboyant red-bearded Irishman became associated with Henry Irving. Just as Polidori had modeled Lord Ruthven on Byron, Stoker no doubt gave Dracula some of Irving's impressive qualities. Bram Stoker claimed that a nightmare about a vampire after a late supper of dressed crab inspired Dracula. However, he had always had an intense interest in the supernatural. He wrote 17 books in all, but only Dracula is really remembered today. He did not live to see the enormous success of his novel, but died in near poverty, according to the death certificate from exhaustion. Stoker's description of Count Dracula still evokes a sense of mysterious destiny. He wrote, Count must indeed have been that voivod Dracula who won his fame against the Turk. If it be so, then he was no common man. For in that time, and for centuries after, he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning, as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. Transylvania. The Draculas were a great and noble race, though now and again were said to have had dealings with the evil one. In one manuscript, this very Dracula is spoken of as vampire, which we all understand too well. The vampire has achieved its greatest popularity as a movie theme. 
In the early days of movies, Theda Bara immortalized the term vamp, which later became a symbol for the Roaring Twenties. The vamp was a kind of vampire, a girl who first charmed her victims before draining them of their love or money rather than their blood. However, in this scene from The Hawk's Trail, made in 1919, our vamp is hired by villains actually to do in Ace Detective Sheldon Steele. Count Phantom, don't you? Yeah, Count Phantom of Pennsylvania. <laughs> hey, Count, boy, am I excited that you're here today. You know, there's one thing I wanted to ask you. Well, actually, a couple of things, see, because well, I knew this guy, see, and he was kind of a, well, he was kind of a therapist that went underground back in the 60s, see, and he started doing a practice with just vampires. And I was wondering if I could try a couple of these things out on you. Feel free. Oh, great. Now, listen, I'm going to show you these pictures, kind of. Well, they're kind of pictures, you know? And I just want you to know, say the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? Whatever they remind you. All right, here, take a look at this one. Blood. Oh, blood, huh? Blood. Well, let's see. Let's try another one. Blood. What a cemetery. Oh. At midnight. Hey, that's Very interesting. Nice. Whoa. Let's you. try this one. Okay. Let's try one more, all right? Feel free. How about that? Oh, that's blood. On a tombstone. Jeez. I'd know it anywhere. <laughs> well, your answers are kind of in one vein, huh? Well, you might Let say me try that, another yes. one here. Hold on. How about that? Blood. Holy cats. On the tracks. Oh, jeez. Okay, now here's a final one, all right? I'm ready. I've always heard that day glow colors have a strange effect on oh, you. No! Ah, hey, come on, come back, man. I'm only kidding. Ah. Hey, I'll be back in a minute, okay? <laughs> In 1921, Max Schreck became the first film Dracula in Nosferatu. This classic silent film was directed by the German expressionist Friedrich Murnau. It drew openly on Stoker's book, and although Murnau gave Stoker the credit, he did not seek permission. The court ordered the negative and all prints destroyed, but somehow the film survived and was shown on a limited basis in London and America. Legal or not, Nosferatu captured a mood which has seldom been equaled. Famous Danish director Carl Dreyer was fascinated by Lefanu's story, Carmilla. 
In 1932, he made his classic film, Vampire, based on the story. Briefly, a young woman is victimized by a vampire. After many adventures, the vampire's helper, Dr. Hieronimko, is buried alive, and the hero drives a stake through the heart of the vampire, an old countess. As always, Dreyer obtained fine performances from his amateur actors. The first mass audience Dracula film was made in 1931 and starred the Hungarian actor Bela Lugosi, who had also played the role of Dracula innumerable times on the stage. The film was an immediate and lasting success. Lugosi said that 97% of his fan mail was from women who found Dracula strangely attractive. You know, I've always found that after spending a long night in the void, I'm always ready for a good existential breakfast when I wake up. You know what I mean? Yeah, and since today's Jean-Paul Sartre's birthday, I figure it's just the time. Yeah, heck, we'll be kind of classy. We'll call it brunch. Hey, why not, huh? Oh, yeah, it's going to be great. See, we'll start off with an existential donut. Oh, now that's wonderful, boy. It's a tiny little ring of nothingness surrounded by dough and sugar. Oh, yeah, it's a great way to start, eh? And then we get to the good part. Yes, I'm going to make us some existential French toast. Oh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. First, you get yourself an existential egg. Sure. Boom, nothing inside. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. Then once you get that in, you take a little existential milk. Now, this comes from non-existent but malcontented cows. Ah, sure. Get a little dollop right in there and then give her a mix. Mmm, boy, yeah, it's taking on a nice consistency. Then you get your existential bread. Yeah, now with the existential bread, you want to make sure to get those crusts cut off. Oh, yeah, 
That adds a little bit of class to the whole thing, you know? Sure, people will think you're really upscale, you know what I mean? Now you get that all set, you pick up your existential bread, and you dip it in your existential mixture. Now that can get a little sloppy, so be careful, yeah. Then you take it out, slap it right on your existential, non-existent grill. Oh man, let it cook for a couple of minutes, flip her off, whoop. Flip her over, yeah, that's good. Oh, a couple of seconds, she's all ready. All right, in honor of Jean-Paul Sartre, I'll take a little petite bite, yeah. Holy cats, what could be better? Orderless, colorless, tasteless, and hardly any calories, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll get back to the movie right after this, okay? Okay. Of the high priest Linja. Linja? 
see you in the house tonight? Yes, the sect of Gusty has members in America. There is a meeting place not far from this house. Here in California. Where is this meeting place? I command you to speak. Speak. Where is the meeting place? There is an old house. A dead tree. A dead tree. Where is this house? How is it reached? Speak, I command you. Reach by the road. From the canyon. And... <coughs> He himself was born in the Hungarian town of Lugos and immigrated to the United States. In the mid-1920s, Lugosi starred with Lila Lee in The Midnight Girl, a silent melodrama. His menacing role in this film is very suggestive of Dracula, the role that was to make him famous several years later. turned out and you're afraid to look behind the curtain and you dread to see the face appearing at the window. 
just remember there are such things.